Okay, um, so you've just turned in homework four. I'll review that assignment. And uh, homework five is going to include some questions on residual management, which is what we're going to get to in Wednesday's class. So I haven't yet posted homework five on Blackboard, but I'll let you know when I do. So I'll grade quiz three and uh, fix the equation in my notes. And today we're going to briefly talk about some specific uh, contaminants and constituents that are removed from drinking water. Uh, this is chapter 14 in the book. We'll only get through about half of the constituents that are mentioned in chapter 14 just because we've only got about 20 minutes so we'll have to keep it quick. Um, so arsenic is probably the uh, most dangerous chemical that is routinely removed from water and it's naturally occurring. It's a naturally occurring um, element that can get dissolved into water just based on the source. You know, if it's a groundwater source in a place that has lots of arsenic in the soil and underground environment, then it'll get dissolved into the water. And um, there are places, in particular in India, where there's a lot of arsenic in the water and um, Bangladesh also suffers from a lot of arsenic in the water. It causes a variety of health problems, both short-term and long-term. It's both acutely toxic and a carcinogen. So you definitely want to get it out of the water. And probably the most common way of removing arsenic is called pre-oxidation. And you may wonder why it's called pre-oxidation. And that is because, you know, oxidation is going to occur at the disinfection step. But pre-oxidation would be you're adding an oxidant prior to most of the other disinfection steps, meaning like uh, coagulation, um, flocculation, and uh, settling, and uh, sand filtration. So if you oxidate, oxidize the water before all those steps, then it will um, take the arsenic out of solution. So arsenic, when it's reduced, is uh, soluble. When it's oxidized, it's less soluble. So arsenic can be found in four different charges, and the least soluble is arsenic 5 plus. And so oxidizing arsenic with chlorine, permanganate, or ozone will uh, allow it to precipitate out and be removed in um, the settling and filtration stages. Now, some of the oxida oxidizing agents that we use for disinfection and are really effective for disinfection don't do anything for arsenic. And so uh, chlorine dioxide, for example, monochloramine, UV, those are all fine disinfectants for viruses and bacteria, but they don't have enough oxidizing power to, uh, to take arsenic out of solution. All right, we've talked a little bit about carbon dioxide before, and it's not a constituent that has health risks necessarily. It's only the indirect effects of carbon dioxide that we have to be concerned with. And it's mainly an issue of economics, in fact, because if CO2 is dissolved in water, then it can inhibit lime soda softening, meaning just that you'd have to add more lime than otherwise you would to increase the pH. Because remember, in the lime soda softening process, what we're trying to do is increase the pH of the water to try and make it so that calcium carbonate will precipitate out of the water and can be settled and removed through filtration. And so CO2 keeps the pH abnormally low. So you just have to add more lime soda softening than you otherwise would. Um, it can also be a post-treatment concern in the case of nanofiltration or reverse osmosis because either of those processes are going to remove constituents like alkalinity and dissolved gases like CO2 will pass through uh, nanofiltration or reverse osmosis. So the, uh, the previous buffering capacity of a water to maintain a normal pH in the presence of an acid is filtered out during nanofiltration reverse osmosis. So you're filtering out the alkalinity. And remember, the definition of alkalinity is a quantitative capacity to neutralize an acid. 
So you're filtering out this thing that normally would neutralize the acid, but what's passing through is CO2. And CO2, when it's dissolved in water, disassociates into carbonic acid, H2CO3. And so that reduces the pH to about 4, and that's um, acidic enough that it can cause corrosion in pipes. So carbon dioxide isn't itself toxic, but we talked about some of the risks of uh, corrosion when we're discussing lead and copper. Remember that if, uh, if lead is leaching from the pipes into the water, then that definitely is a health concern. So it's not necessarily the CO2 that's a problem, but the downstream effects that can occur if CO2 remains in the water after filtration or if it's just costing too much money to do your lime soda softening. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to remove carbon dioxide through air stripping. Air stripping is uh, economical, you know, putting in a whole new unit to, um, to, to blow air through the water is economical when the CO2 is more than 10 milligrams per liter. Otherwise, if you were doing lime soda softening, it would be cheaper rather than creating a whole new step in the process just to go ahead and add more of the lime to, to burn off the CO2 that way. But when you've got more than 10 milligrams per liter, then you're going to have to use so much more lime that it may be economical to instead do um, aeration. And so this is an illustration of a multiple tray aerator, excuse me, aerator. And uh, as you can see, uh, the trays are very similar to baffles. And we talked about in our last class how if you don't have the baffles, then water would just flow directly from one point to the other. So the purpose of these baffles is that you're pumping water at the top that's going to trickle downward because of gravity, and you're blowing air at the bottom of the filter that's going to go upward simply because that's where the vent is, is at the top. So the water's going down, the air is going up, and, um, and with so much uh, air getting entrained into the water that's trickling down around the uh, trays, the CO2 goes from solution into the air. Just like when you pop the top of uh, soda, you know, it had dissolved CO2 in it, and it, it comes out of solution and just gets into the atmosphere. Well, that happens pretty quickly because there's so much CO2 in a can of soda. The process is slower when the concentration of CO2 is less, and so we really have to go to great lengths to get the CO2 out of solution, and those great lengths are you know, blowing in air and having all of these uh, slotted trays. This same air stripping uh, process is used for other constituents besides CO2. Like if you had dissolved uh, volatile organic compounds, um, one that's pretty common is uh, TCE, trichloroethylene, which was used for a lot of years as a dry cleaning fluid and a solvent for removing stains. Uh, there are some places where TCE has contaminated the groundwater, and so before the groundwater can be used, they have to strip out the TCE. And one of the ways to do that is the same process. You just have the water trickling down through a series of trays, air blowing upward, and the TCE, because it's very volatile, will just get stripped out of solution if the thin film of the water going over these trays uh, is thin enough, then it can go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase very quickly. And then the air blowing around it will take the uh, TCE out and just vent it into the atmosphere, or sometimes they'd have granular activated carbon at the outlet and then force the uh, volatile chemical to go into the carbon compound rather than venting into the atmosphere, depending on what the organic constituent is. So air stripping is a pretty potent technology that's used for removing gases that are dissolved into, uh, into water. So here's a, a photo of a carbon dioxide stripping tower where uh, they would be doing softening here and simply to reduce the amount of lime that's being consumed, building this air stripping tower um, would allow them to remove the majority of the carbon dioxide even before the lime is added. 
Here's just another one. Can't really tell what's going inside, but the, uh, the water is going to the top. You can see here's the vent where the air is going out, and then on the inside would be a fan that's drawing air through the inlet and blowing it up. Uh, last time I showed you a picture of people with mottled teeth. They had kind of brown stained teeth that was a result of excess fluoride. And uh, of course fluoride causes damage not just to the enamel on people's teeth, but if the concentrations are really high, it can make bones brittle. And um, you know, fluoride is good in moderate quantities because it strengthens the enamel of the teeth, but if, if uh, teeth and bones get uh, too brittle, then they can lose their strength. So there are some places where fluoride concentrations are too high, and um, the procedure for removing excess fluoride is to use um, activated alumina, which is uh, a, uh, a bead of aluminum AL2O3. It's these small beads that are about uh, five millimeters in diameter. And it's, a, it's very similar to um, ion exchange. Remember when we were talking about how in ion exchange there is a, a filter media that has a preferential absorptive capacity for what you're trying to remove. And so uh, in the case of fluoride, they don't have to put it inside of a, uh, um, inside of a packed column, but they would have um, similar to sand beds, it's just like a layer of sand, you know, for the um, granular filtration. They could have uh, beds, uh, large beds of uh, this activated alumina. And um, it's a pH dependent process where most of the time to remove the fluoride, the water pH would have to be reduced to the range of 5.5 to 6. And then the depth of the column of fluoride that you'd use would be dependent on how much of the fluoride you're trying to remove because uh, there are some places where they don't want to remove all of the fluoride. They want to leave some behind for the benefits uh, that a moderate concentration of fluoride can cause. And so, um, but just like ion exchange, the, uh, the fluoride removal capacity of activated alumina is not infinite. And um, there will be a little bit of clogging of the media that occurs. And um, there will be breakthrough so that you have to monitor the fluoride concentration and what's coming out to see how much remaining capacity the activated alumina has. But when it's starting to achieve breakthrough, then you'd go through the process of backwashing where you have the countercurrent flow that suspends the bed and causes these beads to bang into each other and to shake loose any kind of uh, precipitation that's accumulated or clogging of the filter. And then it's rinsed. And instead of being regenerated with uh, like salt, remember we talked about ion exchange, mostly how uh, you could use sodium to exchange the hardness of calcium and magnesi magnesium. Uh, here, the uh, fluoride removing capacity of the activated alumina is regenerated by a basic solution of sodium hydroxide. And so it's uh, regenerated with the sodium hydroxide, which carries away the fluoride. It, it's the fluoride, by having this uh, highly basic, will make it, uh, will make the fluoride dissolve into solution. And so then you have to waste the sodium hydroxide solution that's rich in fluoride and then rinse it off with water to get the pH back into the range that's needed for removal and then the fluoride can uh, be removed from the activated alumina again. Um, iron and manganese are a couple of constituents that they're not necessarily um, harmful to human health but they definitely can cause um, a bad taste and also other aesthetic concerns like uh, they can stain um, toilets like kind of a, 
a, a, like a yellowish color because of the iron coming out of solution. It can stain clothing. And so the removal of iron and manganese is uh, pretty important because the chlorination that occurs is going to oxidize it and cause the iron and manganese to precipitate. And so again, we use pre-oxidation prior to the steps of um, filtration to force the oxidation of iron and manganese before the steps that we can actually remove it out. And so if you're going to be doing the uh, air stripping, that would be something that you could use to remove iron and manganese. Um, the uh, chlorine dioxide and permanganate and ozone, those can also have enough oxidative capacity that they can be used for pre-oxidation to, uh, to remove iron and manganese. Um, if you're doing it at a point of use, meaning at somebody's house, um, if you live in a place that the municipality is leaving more iron and manganese in the water than you'd want, then you can have uh, your own home removal of iron and manganese in a process that's pretty similar to um, ion exchange. Except for instead of it being an ion exchange resin, what you would use is uh, potassium permanganate, which is often just called uh, green sand because of the appearance of it. Um, so green sand has the ability to remove iron and manganese almost completely and it's pretty effective. Um, there are ion exchange methods separate from green sand that can also work with the advantage that they can be regenerated whereas green sand just has to be used once and then replaced. Of course um, Iron and manganese can be removed from nanofiltration and reverse osmosis because those ions are too large to make it through the very small pores of a nanofiltration filter. And then uh, lime soda softening would be another process that could remove the iron and manganese because um, as you go through that process, it would simply precipitate and could be removed along with the calcium and the magnesium. So those are some of the constituents. Um, we are out of time for today. So uh, you don't have any homework assignment on your plate right now. I'll put that together and we will talk about it on Wednesday. If you want to take another one of those uh, sweets on your way out, where did they end up?